Hello everybody, my name is Bricky, and of course, this is a different kind of video for you today. Normally I do a ton of things like standard gameplay commentaries, you know, just me being Bricky, playing video games, the usual kind of thing. But for today, I want to talk. I want to talk a little bit about a game that I have thoroughly been enjoying as of recently, and that is Dead by Daylight. Now, Dead by Daylight is in the roster of games that I play that are kind of one of those fun but flawed games that have a lot of issues, but at the same time, they're core concepts are so damn fun that I find myself playing them extremely, extremely often. Now, as someone who really appreciates Dead by Daylight and the time being put into Dead by Daylight, it is nice to see how the game has currently changed from the original three killers and moved on forward, how the different metas have swapped, how the new killers and perks have adjusted the way the game plays, and also one of the things I must commend the devs on is the complete and apparent lack of most bugs. Most bugs seem to have been squashed out as of just recently, and as the old things like getting stuck in lockers, getting stuck in pallets, different kinds of areas that you could go to in which a killer could not reach you, most of these major glitches have been fa uh, fizzled out, which is quite nice. However, today's video is discussing the current meta in Dead by Daylight and how it very evidently needs some looking at, how a lot of problems are currently present in the game and making it extremely difficult and very unfun for well, anyone on the killer side. Now, we always do make jokes about survivors being whiny little people, but in reality, it's there's four of them versus one of us. We might just have a little bit of confirmation bias. In reality, both sides can be really, really bitchy. Myself, I am obviously a killer main, roughly around 500 hours in the game, which is a little for some people and a lot for others, but most of that is on killer. I have played plenty of survivor. I have my Meg at like level 30 something, and I have a Dwight and a David somewhere, blah, 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 but I've play very, very little Survivor, because I'm not very good at Survivor, and I don't like people having the option to decide whether or not I live or die. One of my issues with Left 4 Dead, I love Left 4 Dead, don't get me wrong, but especially when you're with randos, they kind of make the choice of whether or not you get to survive in the game, and that's not very fun. However, normally killers get the shit end of the stick a lot of times, and this specific time I want to discuss what part of the stick they're currently getting, and also do some proposed changes on how we can fix that. I'll go ahead and put a timestamp on the screen right now to just go ahead and skip to all the uh, proposed ideas and fixes I'd like added, but until then, let's discuss the problems with the game and why they're the problem. So there are a lot of issues I have with the game. The massive reliance on pallet looping in order to juke and waste the killer's time, the extremely powerful perks that are currently on the other side, such things as decisive strike and borrowed time, and more specifically, the massive lack of stealth options given to survivors, kind of putting the game into a one-dimensional space. Now for starters, this is one of the biggest things I do want to mention. If you have four survivors, all kitted out with the best perks in the game, whether that be self-care, sprint burst, decisive strike, borrowed time, or self-care, uh, dead or harm, decisive strike, and you know, any of these major, very strong perks that are in it. If all four survivors are running these perks, this will always, 100% of the time, nullify a killer who is also running the best perks. Those being, say, Hex Ruin, Barbecue and Chili, Enduring, Overcharge, different things like that. This comes down to the issue that if all four survivors are running the best perks in the game, they will always beat out the killer running his best perks so long as the survivors aren't stupid. And this comes to a quick analogy that also kind of causes me a few problems. Fellow YouTuber and friend of mine, FaZe Jeff, very big in the Call of Duty community, specifically, of course, in FaZe Clan, that really prioritizes things like quick scoping quick scoping montages had a very interesting point to make. In a game of Call of Duty, if you and another player run up to each other and see each other at the same time, and one of those players is sniping, the ability of that sniper to go ahead and be able to quickly quick scope you and kill you immediately is of course not necessarily the easiest thing. Some games it's easier, some games it's harder. However, that person, that person with an assault rifle or a shotgun or whatever it might be, never gets to make that choice. The skill of the sniper will always be the one making the first move. Now, if he misses his shot and he's not a very good sniper, 90% of the time he will die right there. But because of your ability to consistently hone your skills and become really, really good, he will always be making that first move. And that can feel pretty oppressive sometimes. This segues into Dead by Daylight because survivors are the ones who always get to make their 
that first decision. Being able to out-rotate, prioritize objectives correctly, being able to simply run a circle around the killer and do everything that he's not currently focusing on creates a very difficult problem, which is why the only times I ever seem to be able to get, say, a three or a four man in Dead by Daylight is when survivors are making mistakes. The ability for me as a killer to win is almost solely based on the ability for survivors to make mistakes. I am not able to create a situation in which I have control. It is always whether or not they screw up. And the better they are, the fewer opportunities they have to screw up and the fewer opportunities I have to capitalize on it. An example, camping. Everyone hates camping. It's generally not fun for the killer and it's generally not fun for the survivor. Now, a perk like borrowed time makes camping a little bit less difficult, but it doesn't really stop the tunneling problem. And camping sometimes works, but it only works when survivors are making mistakes. Let's do a little bit of math here. In order to correctly face camp a survivor, you need to be sitting in front of their face for 120 seconds, two minutes, 60 seconds on part one, 60 seconds on part two. That is, of course, if they don't auto kill themselves on the hook or attempt to pull themselves off. It takes exactly 80 seconds, eight zero, for one survivor to complete a generator. So if three survivors are currently working on generators, three separate generators, while you are face camping someone at the hook, they are able to get three whole generators completely finished and then have 40 seconds more to complete another. This is also not counting any great skill checks they land or if they have a toolbox. And the better the survivor is, the more great skill checks they will land and they'll probably be bringing toolboxes, making this occur even faster. Add the fact that you'll most likely already have a generator pop before you even hook your first survivor and you're in a very, very no-win situation. You see, that's the thing. Camping only works when survivors make the choice to ignore generators and attempt to dive bomb your hook or attempt to all crowd around. Camping in its own sense only works when survivors make mistakes. If survivors have perfect, 100% excellent gameplay, constantly rotating, always doing generators, and are always on top of it, they will always be a killer with perfect gameplay because a killer simply can't be in every spot at once. If survivors have perfect gameplay, the killer can't deal with four survivors at a time. He can deal with one, sometimes bop off and try to go get the other one, but most of the time, he can only work with one because that goes to the point of how much time they can waste thanks to the massive amount of looping. Now, this is of course dependent on Hillbilly, Nurse, and Huntress, but the fact that they can waste so much time running around the area makes it even more difficult for said killer to get the rest. And on that topic, Pallets and pallet looping is inherently boring design, but it's not something you really should fault survivors for doing because they have no stealth choices. Consistently, as time has gone on, stealth options have dwindled. The doctor's pure existence, nurses calling, barbecue and chili, whispers, spies from the shadows, Freddy's pure existence, so many things are removing the ability to do stealth and forcing survivors to no longer take stealth perks. They rely on the running around of pallets so often because that's really their only option, but it's also a very strong option. If you reduce the amount of pallets in a game or simply redesign the map so there are way fewer loops, killers would be way too powerful. But at the same time, there's no incentive for someone to play stealthy. You don't get points for playing stealthy. You get points for being in a chase, you get points for dropping pallets on people, and you get points for saving people. You don't get points for hiding behind a rock, and therefore no one does it. This creates a massive divide in the current roster of characters. Now you see, the nurse is incredibly good because of poor stealth options. The biggest counter to the nurse is stealth. She does not have very good tracking of any kind. Constant line of sight breaking, hiding behind certain areas because of her slow movement speed alone makes it very, very strong. Urban evasion and iron will destroy the nurse. 
but so few people take those two perks because stealth is not good enough. The lack of stealth options is what brings the nurse to such a ridiculous level. It's not because of the nurse's power. Sure, it's very good, but jukes and things like that are quite strong. It's the inability to lose the nurse or be stealthy and make sure she never finds you. If you ever play the nurse against somebody who has iron will, you understand how difficult it is to track that person and imagine if everyone was running it because it was good but i digress this causes an issue with the roster now the best killers hillbilly huntress and nurse they fare okay after their glitches have been fixed of course they fare perfectly fine the issue comes to the fact that there's such a massive divide between them and and the rest. Those three stay very high up on the list. The doctor is the only one who is in this nice little middle ground between him and the rest of the cast. The rest of the cast is far, far less effective. The difference in effectiveness between the doctor and someone like say Michael Myers is massive. The divide between the two is huge and the divide between the doctor and the top three is huge. So you essentially have over 60% of the roster that just absolutely gets destroyed by anyone with a semblance of knowing what they're doing. The fact that all these killers are subject to the same looping, same issue and really don't make any huge difference or ability to actually take control away from the survivor causes them to be very poor, especially with the speed at which generators are done. The pig's entire creation was to slow down generators, but by the creation of the pig, they haven't fixed the problem for any of the rest of the cast. And even then, the pig is still mildly mediocre due to the fact that her bear traps are too easily removed and also the fact that she still has to deal with the super fast gents most of the time and the pallet loops. This has been an ongoing issue with the development of Dead by Daylight. Too many issues are being quote unquote solved, not because of an actual mechanic being swapped, but because of a perk or a killer being added. Stealth too strong? The Doctor. Jen's too fast? The pig. Pallet looping sucks? The nurse. Don't like campers? Borrowed time. Got caught out a little bit too early? Decisive strike. Jen's being done too fast? Part two? Hex ruin. Jen's are being done too fast. Okay, this is the pig. It'll help slow down Jen's. Cool. What about literally every other killer in the game? Sucks? Like, like what do you, what do you want what do you want them to do? Literally, the only counter to Jens being done at ridiculously high speeds is Hex Ruin, a hex perk that slows down the process but doesn't stall it as I've seen people blow through Hex Ruin very fast, and is of course linked to a hex, a destroyable perk. Hex Ruin is without a doubt one of the strongest killer perks in there and can be removed within 10 seconds of the game. Can you imagine if I, as a killer, entered the game, found a little totem, kicked it a few times, and removed everyone's decisive strike? That would really suck. I understand that the difference in power does not make them equal, but the point still remains. So with that being said, I want to get into proposed fixes for a lot of these issues. Now, let me be honest when I say that I am not a game developer. I do not make games. I am not on the balance team. I do not necessarily have the experience to speak on the topic, but I feel like I have enough minor band-aid fixes to help out either certain killers or the game in general. Number one, hex perks. There are two choices in this matter. The first one is that the hex perk starts off inactive. The killer can then go find a totem on the map and then I imagine the animation would be kicking it but light said totem to therefore start the hex perk right there and then. This will allow the killer to choose a certain area for the hex totem to be in and also by doing so make it so survivors don't remove it in the beginning. If you're wondering what happens even multiple hex perks, very simple. Do it in an order from left to right on your loadout screen. The second proposed change is making a hex perk go on cooldown when destroyed rather than actually be removed. 
this being a two, two and a half, three minute cooldown in which once it's finished, it loses all of its stacks and can be replaced. So if you were a five stack Huntress Lullaby and it gets destroyed, you can place it again, but it will start with zero stacks. This does two things. This will slow down the game mildly because this will force survivors to go cleanse dull totems to remove the ability for killers to place more totems. If every dull totem on the map is removed, the killer doesn't get that hex perk anymore. This will slow down the game, and also, if you cleanse enough, the killer will of course have to look around the map trying to find a hex totem, and therefore, by cleansing totems, you are naturally wasting his time. It's a nice give and take. Cleanse more totems, which slows the game down, but also slows the killer down if he tries to replace the totem. Part number two some form of early sickness, say morning sickness for survivors. Immediately when they load into the game, I believe they should have some form of action speed penalty for the first, give or say, a minute. So as soon as they spawn in the game, they have 60% slower action speed, and then every second it goes by, it'll be 59, 58, 57 until they're back to their normal state. This will stop those very unfortunate times in which a killer simply walks across the map to generators where he thinks survivors may be at, they're not at, and then three generators are immediately popped. Next up, stealth. Give survivors blood points for being stealthy. Make it so that when they are out of a chase, give them two blood points a second. Therefore, if it's, say, a 10-minute game and they are never in a single chase, that's 1,800 extra blood points for playing stealthy. This, of course, could be changed and, and altered depending on, you know, what values you want to use it for, but allow them to slowly accumulate blood points for not being in a chase. It Blood points, money, in general, is always a very, very good incentive. This is why people run things like We're Gonna Live Forever and Barbecue and Chili, not because barbecue and, chili, I mean, barbecue and chili is a great perk, but because I really want those blood points. For Decisive Strike, this one is a little bit iffy. It might not be the best decision, but it's just an idea I had. Make it so it immobilizes the killer. So a survivor can wiggle and wiggle and wiggle, and they will choose when they want to stab you, not at a predetermined time. This will have you stuck or standing still for that period of time, but not drop you. So let's say if there's a hook nearby, it doesn't matter. Decisive Strike will 100% not do anything. But let's say the hooks are very, very far away. This could give them just enough extra wiggle time to get out of your hands if you were trying to be greedy and going for a far away hook or bring their survivor friend with a flashlight, go ahead and get close to you in order to try and get a nice blind on you. This is just an idea. I don't know if it'll work. I don't know if it'll be overpowered. It certainly might be, but who knows? Slippery meat. You should get one free Kobe. Very simple. This should allow you to Kobe off the hook at least once. And if not that, Make it so it takes them longer to be actually sacrificed. Make it so it takes like 80 seconds in the second phase. The Hag. Boost her movement speed to normal. I swear to God. She needs a new, uh, a whole rework. She needs an entire rework, but give her normal movement speed. It's a solid, simple band-aid fix. I would like something to be done about survivors that run to pallets and get like sucked in and teleported. I don't know how you would fix that, so whatever, but that is something I just want to mention. No Mither. No Mither should be buffed. You should start the game at full and healthy, and it should not give you a little image telling you that this is that person that cannot be rehealed. This The killer should figure this out on their own. As for so many of the other perks, and for so many of the other killers and such, the differences in the changes are too advanced for someone like me who does not do game balancing. At the current moment, these are all just ideas and band-aid fixes that I wish would be implemented. If you leave with anything, at least leave with the idea of the early like morning sickness for survivors and the hex perk change. Both of these I think are, are solid choices that are really help push things in the middle, especially the hex perk cooldown one. I really like that idea. I think it's good. It gives survivors a thing to do that isn't gen, slowing down the game a bit. And if they do still want to do gens and not do totems, they will have to deal with the consequences. That, combined with the morning sickness type idea to keep them from doing gen so fast, I feel like there could be some decent changes to the game and it could help with the entire meta of the game. Now I am a killer main. I've been a killer main for a while. My opinions are obviously biased as, as 
they always are. I think it's generally considered that things like Decisive Strike are horribly overpowered and there are a lot of issues with the game and such, but at the end of the day, I always want to go back to that quick scoping analogy. The killer does not get the choice of winning. The best perks on the killer and the best perks on the survivors, the survivors will always win unless they make mistakes. And I should not be forced to have me winning be determined on bad plays from other people. It should be on good plays from me. Thank you all very much for watching. I appreciate it very much. If this is viewed or watched by anyone on the Dead by Daylight development team and staff, uh, let me go ahead and make it very clear. I bash the game a lot, don't get me wrong, but it is one of those bash because I love it kind of things. I have a lot of problems, but I still play it religiously. I find it incredibly fun. And at the end of the day, you should be very proud of what you've created. So keep at it, keep working. I hope everything is going phenomenal, and I'm extremely excited to see what you have in the future. My name has been Bricky, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.